This is Twit. <laughs> now, um, you're new to all of this. So I've been doing a series for the past few weeks on how Scottish whiskey is made. Oh. And along the way, as I explain sort of the next steps, I mention a whiskey that's unique in that particular of that stretch. So we've talked about growing barley, malting it, drying it, gr- grinding it, uh, turning it into a wash, putting it through the mash tons, fermentation. Last week it was distillation, and I talked about the different kinds of stills that Scottish whisk distilleries use. This week's conversation is about maturation and aging, or typically putting into to barrels. So we left off at a point where you have now created new make spirit. So you've gone typically through a double distillation. In some cases, there's a triple distillation. And so you're coming in and around. You've got a clear spirit. It's about 70 to 74 percent ABV. And now it needs to be aged. For it to qualify to be Scottish whiskey, it has to spend a minimum of three years in oak casks. And you'll typically see on a bottle of whiskey, you'll see a year on it. Uh, or a, n- a number of years that it's been that, that it was aged. That number, say it's like we're talking about Macallan 12. That means that the youngest thing in that bottle is 12 year old whiskey. Oh. Now, you'll never see a three year old whiskey, even though nominally it is allowed to be. Uh, they usually age longer than that. Three year old whiskey doesn't taste all that good. Uh, it's still pretty clear spirit. So they tend to age longer than that in these different kinds of barrels. Um, and interesting that it's oak barrels. Now, we've been using oak to make barrels literally for centuries um, because oak tends to swell when it gets liquid, and so it seals itself fairly well. Uh, in the case of whiskey, they typically use only a couple of kinds of barrels, and I'm using their their Latin names. Quercus alba is what we normally call American white oak. There are variations on it, but it's the most common kind. And in Scottish whiskey, we get those barrels extensively because of bourbon so in the, in bourbon land you have to use american white oak that is toasted on actually charred on the inside and you can only use it once so there's a lot of american oak barrels made for bourbon and then they can't be used again for bourbon but the scots will happily buy them and use them american barrels are small they're about 190 liters that's 50 u.s gallons for those who need the measurements of the oppressors <laughs> although um The Scots will generally remake them into hogsheads. Now, a hogshead is a um, 55 imperial gallon barrel because having more than one gallon makes the system better. There are 250 liter barrels. And the way they'll do this is they'll take five American bourbon barrels and they'll rebuild them into four hogsheads or hoggies. Oh, boy. So this is the process. This is cooperage. This is the process of remaking, uh, remaking the barrel uh, into 250 liter, kind of the smallest kind of barrel you want to use. Um, the, another very popular barrel to make Scottish whiskey is Quercus Robur or the European or Spanish oak barrel, typically found in the form of sherry casks. There's lots of different kinds of sherry. Most of it comes from Spain. Their normal barrel is a 500 liter or 110 imperial gallon uh, barrel. These are much bigger barrels because in sherry making, they don't want a lot of wood flavor in the drink. So they use a much bigger barrel. So there's less surface area contacting the liquid. They slightly toast the barrel. Now, why in the world would whiskey distilleries use sherry casks? Well, because in the old days, that's how you shipped sherry. So when they would ship sherry, up to scotland it would come in barrels and they made no sense to ship the barrels back that's expensive so you might as well use them and they started aging scottish whiskey in sherry casks and the first records that i could find on this was from 1814 that they were aging in sherry casks now by 1986 Spain required that all exported sherry be exported in bottles not in casks anymore which eliminated that flow of barrels but by then, the market for sherry cask aged whiskey was so large that the Scottish whiskey makers were very concerned about this. And there actually grew up a business in Spain to make sherry casks to order for aging Scottish whiskey. Now, this is an expensive process because you're basically having them make up a 500 liter barrel 
and then do a first aging of sherry in it, which is typically, they call it a must aging. It's not very good. Most of that, then after they've done the three years to get it to that state, they'll ship the barrel over to Scotland. What they get out of it, they typically then turn into Spanish brandy. Mm. Uh, occasionally, you will find French oak barrels or Querula sessiflora. Um, these are typically for wine and cognac casks that are sometimes used as finishing caskings for Scottish whiskey. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, just a quick rundown on how a barrel works. So these are strips of oak. They tend to be wider in the middle, narrow at the end so that they can give a curve to the barrel. They're held together with steel or iron hoops. Traditionally, these are six hoops. Uh, the French do eight hoops because France. Uh, and then they have oak panels on the gen called the head ends that are fitted together with grooves. Uh, at the widest part of the barrel, known as the bilge, is a bunghole. Uh, traditionally, this bunghole is capped with wood, but it's the filling point. It's also the thiefing point. As barrels age and you're checking their progress, you will pop the bung and thief from the barrel and they check the ABV and, and we'll give it a taste and so forth. I have had opportunity to do tours where we have thiefed from a few barrels. It's a ton of fun and you're tasting whiskey in its earlier stages, which is really cool. Uh, most while the barrels are wood because we want the flavors from the wood, the bungs these days are mostly made of silicon because they are easily removable and they don't get uh, they don't allow bacteria to grow on them particularly well. Which brings us to this great question of why the heck do we like wood? Like it's weird. Why do humans like the taste of wood? We've always burned wood to make fire. We cooked food over it and that smoke seemed to benefit. It's also antibacterial. You know, trees solve the battle with bacteria long before mammals even existed on this planet. They're some of the longest lived creatures and they have a structure that's designed to fight bacteria. Um, for the most part, uh, especially in the case of oak, you, you've got three primary components, cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignans, uh, along with a few volatile compounds, acetic fatty acids, various kinds of phenols and tannins. When we toast the wood, we're actually starting to convert some of those long change hy hydrocarbons in the cellulose into sugars. Okay. So... Uh, that char does a few things. One is that it actually lifts some of the bad notes out of whiskey. Like we often are battling sulfur from the, the, the barley that can make it quite sour. That tends to stick to the charcoal. Um, the, and we are dealing with these, these volatile compounds that we get from charring the wood a bit and then introducing solvents to it. What solvents? Well, that's the alcohol. So when you go, when you're going to pour uh, the, this clear make into the barrel, uh, you're going to have a ratio of alcohol and water, right? When I talk about, hey, this new make is 73% ethanol, well, what's the other 27%? Mostly water and a few other things. Now, 73% is actually too high to put into a barrel because some of the compounds that are in the wood are lipophilic. They like alcohol and they'll bind to it. Some of them are hydrophilic. They like water and they'll bind to that. And that ratio is important. If you, the, the alcohol, the, the lipophilic compounds tend to be spicier and woodier, where the hydrophilic compounds tend to be sweeter and smoother. So we find vanillins like to bond to water, where the spicier compounds like guayacol and eugenol, which is that smell of cloves, they tend to bind to alcohol. Also, you're typically most of the time in Scottish whiskey you, dealing with a used barrel. They've been used before. They and they, in the case of bourbon, only used once. Sherry casks are often used for quite a long time before they will actually sell them. Although now they're sort of purpose made. In whiskey making, a first used barrel, what they call a first fill, so it's been used once. It's been typically used by bourbon, and bourbon has a lower ingress alcohol level, typically coming in at about 62.5%. And so with that ratio, it's pulled certain compounds from the wood already. What Scottish ma Scots makers will do is they'll put a slightly higher alcohol level into the barrel. So they'll, well, they may, their distillate may come out at 72%. They'll then cut that with distilled water to get it down to 63.5%. So 1% higher than the bourbon that was in it before to lift different flavors ah, up. Ah, got it. And so there's this game you're playing with the mix of water and alcohol as to what flavors you're trying to extract from the wood. And in a new fair barrel, barrel, they'll actually go lower than that because often these compounds can get very bitter. So the first time they use a bourbon barrel, now it's already had bourbon in it, 
but they're going to use it for the first time for, for whiskey. They might go as low as 60%. And then they'll use, and then they'll take a second filled barrel. So one that's been used once before, and that might have 63%. And as they use the barrel over and over again, typically four or five times, they'll raise the alcohol level each time to pull more flavor from the barrel. Now you're putting these things, you're putting that liquor into the barrel for eight to 12 years and you don't really know how long it's going to be. And there's a lot of forces that are acting on it, right? You don't really know what's going to come of that. So often, and we'll talk about this next week uh, when we talk about what we take out of the barrel, even though it's all a given malting, you might put a portion of that given malting in first fill barrels and another portion in second and third fill barrels. And you'll dilute them differently to get the different flavors from them. Most barrels are filled almost entirely depending on the distilleries. Uh, part of the forces that are going to act on this, we'll talk a bit about angel share, uh, is the oxidation part. You need some room for air to be inside the barrel. And some distilleries will fill it less to increase the amount of available air that will be exchanged over time. But generally speaking, if you put more in the barrel, you're going to get more result because we're going to lose some over time. Um, if you start your barrel full, it ages slower effectively. Hmm. Barrels are stored in a variety of ways. The traditional storage methodology for whiskey barrels is called a dunnage warehouse. And dunnage actually is a tax term. So back before they taxed by the bottle, when they were taxing by the distillate, you were actually putting your barrel into a bonded warehouse where it would age. So that it would be accounted for tax when it was put into the warehouse. You would pay the tax when you sold it. So it's like now, Roth IRA versus uh, 401k. That kind of thing. And believe me, we're, we're talking about hundreds of years of taxation related to alcohol. Wow. And in, in earlier shows, we've talked about things like spirit stills where they literally they can't touch the spirit. They have to control it by remote control because the tax man controls access to the spirits. Oh, my. So as we get through, you know, again, these are very traditional mechanisms. Dunnage used to be the way that they would do the final taxation on it. And a traditional dunnage warehouse and most distilleries still operate on these. It's a very traditional style are stone walls with a wooden with a wooden structure roof with tile on top of the roof and dirt floors the they have relatively low ceilings the barrels are laying on their side so they're horizontal which increases the open amount of access to wood uh, they're stacked two or three high because the dirt they have to have dirt floors they can't use machinery so the barrels are basically loaded by hand up to three high and remember that a uh, a gallon of whiskey weighs about eight pounds. So when you're talking about a hundred gallon, oh 500 God. liter barrel, like get some friends, there's going to be some lifting involved there. Now, <laughs> yep. um, more contemporary uh, warehouses, and this, these are pretty common too, are what they call the rack houses. Now, an rack house in America for bourbon is very different from, which is the way most bourbon is made, very different from a rack house in Scotland. These rack houses in Scotland are concrete floors. The barrels are still stored horizontally, same as a dunnage warehouse, but they're on racks that can go as many as 12 barrels high. So quite tall structures. Um, they can obviously have machine handling because they have to get quite that high. And the barrels are organized in a way where air is allowed to flow around them. And that's an important part of the aging process. So they're, they're, they're stacked in position and then aged for an extended period of times. The most contemporary versions of, of storing systems now are palletized warehouse. Um, para, and, and when they use pallets for barrels, they're standing them upright. So rather than on the side, they're, they're upright. They're stacked one layer on a pallet. Then those pallets are stacked one on top of each other. And they can, again, be quite high. So not as much wood touching in that instance, then, if they're stacked. Not as much, yeah. And the, the liquor's not touching the, uh, the wood as much because you're, uh, you're sitting upright. You don't have as much air availability. So mm -hmm. there's a slowing of the aging process. Uh, and depending on which distiller you talk to, that is heresy and everyone should be burned at the stake. <laughs> All barrels should be stored horizontally. There's a lot of passion yeah. in making yeah. whiskey yeah. And, <laughs> and, and the barrel storage is a huge part of it. Anything other than dunnage would be sacrilege, you know, depends on who you talk to. But we got to talk about the angel's share because now we get into the dangerous part of this business. So it's a wooden barrel. It breathes. 
over time, as the seasons come and go, as it gets warmer, a certain amount of the alcohol is going to evaporate from the barrel. And depending on where that barrel lies in the various storage systems, it's going to lose more or less. There's this thing called the honey uh, spots, which are sort of the places where it, it, it makes the best whiskey. Not every location is the same. If you're higher in the rack, it's going to be warmer up there in the summertime. So you're going to have higher rates of loss, but you lose up to one, up as many as much as 3% of alcohol per year. Whoa. And remember that the rule for whiskey is if that barrel falls below 40%, you can't sell it as whiskey. So you went into the barrel at 63 or 64% and you're losing a certain amount each year. Now, if it gets too warm, it can actually start to lose water and the alcohol percentage will increase. Although this has more to do with humidity than anything else. So one of the reasons for the Dunnage warehouses with their stone walls and dirt floors is it maintains a higher humidity mm -hmm. and a high humidity environment will tend to evaporate alcohol where in a place like Kentucky, where it's quite a bit warmer and quite a bit drier, the bourbon folks battle losing water and their alcohol level getting too high. And if you get too high in bourbon, you're not allowed to call it bourbon either. So often you'll see in some uh, distilleries in America, especially they'll cool their barrel rooms to try and manage that, that heat problem. Watering it down it, is not the same then if you, if you had that sort of higher alcohol content then just add some water to it before you send it off is that, a no, no, it's pretty much against the rules to do anything to the barrels. Plus it's not scalable. You think about the racks and racks of barrels. So they're pretty much leaving them alone for an extended period of time. Uh, but they will check on them and they'll check their ABV. So that's that whole thiefing process mm -hmm. where okay, the occasionally the barrel will go in, they'll pop a bung. They'll take a thief, which is basically a glass tube. You hold your thumb over the end of it. Uh, where you leave your thumb off, you dip it into the barrel, you put your thumb on, you lift it back out, you get a little strip of the of the raw whiskey, whatever's been happening in that barrel. You put it in a couple of glasses, you take a sniff, you test for ABV, what's the current alcohol level, you can see the rate of decline. I'd also point out that alcohol evaporated in the air is an explosive. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So you'll generally see in traditional, especially traditional Dunnage warehouses, like the ends are open. They allow that, that gas to dissipate and the alcohol actually sticks to things and turns them black. Um, huh. And this gets extreme in certain environments. There's a, recently some news stories in the in bourbon country in Kentucky where, I mean, forests are getting destroyed by the, the mold that grows related to that, that alcohol exposure. But, you know, you can recognize old Dunnage warehouses because you'll see a lot around the roof line and so forth is blackening from the alcohol contamination as it evaporates. Uh, and so weather matters a lot. It's part of the game to this. Of course, if alcohol is going to leave the barrel, something needs to come in. It's not like there's negative pressure in the barrel. So you're also breathing. You're bringing air into the barrel. And most of that air is going to have come from other barrels because they're all doing that. But there is this, in, there is a sense of the terror of what comes from the environment. And a great example of this is Talisker on the Isle of Skye in the western, most, westernmost part of Scotland amongst the islands that there's a little hint of salt in the whiskey from the salt in the air that gets drawn in <laughs> through this angel air process over time. Uh, and of course the, in that, out, that evaporation process, the amount of liquid in the barrel is going down year over year. You're trying to stay above that 40% point, but it's one of the reasons that older whiskeys are so expensive. Not every barrel makes it that long. Not every barrel it, it, ABV stay high enough to find a whiskey that's 50 years old where the youngest thing in the bottle is 50 years old is to speak to an extraordinary barrel that just lost so little alcohol over such a long time. Uh, it'll be much more concentrated. Uh, barrels do leak. They do get cracks that cooling and heating of the seasons can be problematic. A very hot summer or a very cold winter can damage them. Uh, sometimes they can be fixed just with a bit of hammering. Pushing those bands of steel down to tighten the wood uh, is enough to stop it from leaking. There's barrel wax to seal it up. I've seen copper plates hammered onto pieces of, of a barrel to seal it. Um, it's interesting just to see the active bacterial processes they do with all of that. So we're talking about aging. Uh, and again, if you talk about traditional single malt whiskeys, you typically see them in the 10 to 12 year range. And that means they've been sat in a barrel for that long. No aging happens in bottles. It all happens in the casks. And so the real question you have to ask is, well, when's the whiskey ready? Well, you know, what does ready even mean? 
So the barrel men are sampling different bot casks at different locations on a routine basis. And they're watching the ABV. They don't want it to fall too low. And they're also studying flavor profiles. And we're going to get into next week into the finishing part of that, which gets into the really miraculous part, which is how do you make a whiskey taste like a whiskey year over year over year? Why does Macallan 12 always taste like Macallan 12? There's an art form to that. And it's extraordinary. But it, Aging is not as simple as it used to be. It used to be you put it in a cast for a certain amount of time, then you taste it. If it tasted pretty good, go sell it. But that's not what happens today. You're doing bottling. There's many, many casts involved. It's much more complex than that. And since the 1980s, starting with a, a particular distiller from Balvenie, a guy named David Stewart, they started doing finishing caskings. So if you look at a fairly famous whiskey in this category, is Balvenie's Doublewood. What David actually figured out that was clever is you can start in sherry cask and run it for 10, 12 years. And then at the end, take it out of that barrel and put it in a different barrel, like a sherry cask for just about a year. You don't want to age a long time or, or, or in port casks for a long time. Sherry casks, they do long aging in, but port casks, they typically no more than a year. Um, but you're also seeing finishing casks of all kinds now, red wine, uh, rum, cognac. I've even found one where they did a final year in tequila. Mm. I don't know that it, it's just anywhere between six to 24 months. They do these finishing casts okay. before they send off, but it's always this question of, you know, when is it ever ready? And, um, that brings me to my whiskey for this particular show, which we're going to go to the lowlands to a distillery called Akintoshin. Uh, great name, Akintoshin. It's barely in the lowlands. It's all the lowlands is the lower part of, of Scotland, uh, attached to England. Uh, it's a smaller area than the Highlands, which is the largest area. Uh, this particular distillery is all the way west, barely in the lowlands. In fact, it gets its water from the Highlands. It's northwest of Glasgow on an area called Clydebank. Uh, Clydebank was an important port during World War II. And in fact, the Auchentoshan distillery was heavily bombed during World War II. And today, one of their large cooling ponds is actually an old crater from the war. Wow. Uh, they reconditioned. The uh, distillery is owned by Suntory, which is a Japanese company that's rolled up a bunch of these different distilleries. And we'll talk about that one of these days. Their mash tons are stainless with copper lids. They use wooden washbacks and they do triple distillation, which is very unusual. So they have their regular wash and spirit distillate, uh, stills. And then there's a third still called an intermediate still, which is weird because it's at the end. But let's not get technical here. <laughs> and so their typical new right. make well, then, comes well, out at 81%. Sound alcohol, which is very high compared to most whiskeys. Now, my personal favorite of all the Akintoshans, the one if I see one, I will grab it, is their Three Wood. And it's about $50 US for a bottle. And it's called Three Wood because they do their first 10 years in bourbon casks and then will put the distillate into a year of Oloroso sherry and then a year of Pedro Jimenez sherry and, and bottle that. But the one I wanted to talk about, it's not on the list anymore, but you can find it if you look about it, which is a very unusual whiskey is their virgin Oak about $70 a bottle. If you can find one, the whiskey exchange has it, but it's one of the very few Scottish whiskeys that goes into raw wood. Oh, so they buy American Oak that has never been used, have it made into barrels and they finish their virgin Oak in that. Uh, it's got a unique flavor. There's a harshness to young wood uh, that uh, gives it a little more kick for what is relatively uh, a short aged whiskey, but it's triple distilled. So that high distillation, then they cut it with water before they put it in the barrel. It gets a lot more spice for what is normally lowlands tend to be very smooth. And this one's got a bit more punch, but it's an exotic whiskey. And again, it's the kind of whiskey I would buy for someone who's really into whiskey. And this is one they'll never try again. They've only done two editions of this. The first edition is unfindable. Uh, the second edition, there's still a few around for about $70. Wow. Okay. That's, that was, this is fun. <laughs> uh, I, I love learning new things. So this was a lot of fun to hear about this process for sure. Yeah. So next week's show, we'll, uh, we'll talk about finishing. So the whole process of getting from all of those casks, when are they ready? How do you combine them? How do you bottle them? And what are the last steps to making a bottle of whiskey before you can sell it? Beautiful. 